This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. Straight ahead on the program, a busy week for investors on Wall Street. Apple, Microsoft leading the earnings cavalcade. And we'll also get a Fed decision and the January jobs report. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Caroline Hepke in London, where we're looking ahead to the Bank of England's first rate decision of 2024. I'm Brian Curtis in Hong Kong. We look ahead to China's PMIs and whether recent support measures can turn the tide in the Chinese economy. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the business news you need to wrap up your week. Available on Apple, Spotify, the Bloomberg Business app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby. We begin today's program with a very busy week ahead for earnings on Wall Street. We'll hear from more than 100 companies in the S&P 500 with big tech leading the way. Results from Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and Meta platforms, among others. For a closer look at what to expect from the two $3 trillion giants, Apple and Microsoft, we're pleased to bring in Anurag Rana, senior tech analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, Anurag, let's start with Apple, which has been (laughs) a lot of headlines lately for its new Vision Pro mixed reality headset, trouble with the smartwatch, app store commissions, challenges for the iPhone sales in China. So what are you expecting to see from Apple's Q1 on Wednesday? Listen, I I hope they give some good news about China, because as you said, you know, for, for I mean, it's an amazing company, but all I can say is in the last two months, all I've heard is just negative news come out for Apple. So it's, a, you know, for their sake, I hope they come out and give some good comments about China and they can, you know, grow the smartphones in that particular market, because that is the single biggest factor that can dictate how they're going to grow this year. Um, so so that's, that's, that's a forefront on our mind right now. Well, we did get a, a surprise to the upside, though, for 2023 in iPhone sales in China, though, didn't we? Yes, but at the same time, I think expectations were so low. But, but you know, I, I still have to see how things shape up in 2024 because, you know, we have seen that Huawei's phone was, was doing pretty well around the holidays. So, we you know, we, we still need to, to uh, figure out how December uh, shapes up. And how about iPhone sales everywhere, everywhere else but China? See, the problem with everywhere else is, and I'm I'm going to talk about developed markets, you know, markets like the U.S. and Western Europe, um, it is relatively mature or I would say stagnant. So when you see those markets, the install base of the number of people that have phone, that's only going to grow gradually, let's say at the rate of about 2 to 3%. That's not much to really you know, boost the, the top line of the company. It was really China as the growth, growth engine right now because when you look at the number of units there, China has about 1 billion smartphones out there. Apple has an, uh, you know, about an 18% market share or somewhere in that range. So we still have a long way to go for Apple to grow in that market. Um, and, and I think that's really was, was you know, my hope that uh, if they can continue to grow well in China, then the next big market over the next three to five years is going to be India and so forth. So that kind of gives you like a 10-year uh, growth driver. But if China's going to slow down, um, you're not going to see massive, massive growth there, then it brings down the growth rate of the entire company. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, another possible generator of revenue, the Vision Pro mixed reality headset. <laughs> when, what? <laughs> Not yet, but and there was a burst of enthusiasm when, when pre-orders came out just uh, this past week. But what do you see there? Yeah, it, it's, you know, at $3,500, I mean, it's not a needle mover to me because, you know, to be very honest, how many how many units can you sell in a year? Let's say you sell half a million units. That's about $1 billion or $1.5 billion in sales. So it's really not, it's not something that I think it's going to add to the big top line of the company. Because remember, Apple's revenue base is $400 billion. So even if you can go out and you know sell, let's say, 1 million units, it's not, 1 million is way above anybody is expecting. That's like, you know, 1% of the revenue of the, less than 1% of the revenue of the total company. So it's it's a lot of good discussion. We'll have a lot of fun when it's out there and people are going to play around with it. But it's really not a needle mover when you look at some financial analysis. Uh, and, and another hit that uh, Apple's taking is the, the regulatory challenges to its commission on its, to app developers on the App Store. What What's the latest there? Because that could yeah billions, that, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. That is, I think, the single biggest issue right now. It's this 
everything that's legal, legal challenges and regulatory challenges around their app store and around the services business in general. I mean, not just the app store, you know, the money that they receive from Google. It's a lot of discussion around it. And I think that is something that we spend most of our time looking into. Um, we recently had a webinar topic, talking about this topic. We have a podcast on it. So we, you know, we, this is a, this is a serious, serious stuff because not, is remember one thing, a dollar that you generate on the app store probably has operating margins of 75%. This is very high margin business. So if there are issues around, you know, how much fees can they charge, how much it's going to go down, all sorts of stuff that really does have, you know, hamper not just the top line revenue, but also the, um, the profitability of the company. Oh, boy. Well, let, now let's move to Microsoft then, which has made big bets on artificial intelligence and cloud computing, and they seem to be paying off pretty well. What do you think? I think, you know, they, they are probably one of the better positioned companies in technology right now in, you know, I would say on a holistic way, because it's, they have so many businesses but the really big driver, at least for the near term, is going to be their cloud infrastructure business. Now, if you look at you know, OpenAI as a company, OpenAI's backend is Microsoft's uh, cloud infrastructure. So you use a lot more chat GPT, Microsoft makes more money off of it. So that's, that's the way you want to think about it. Last time when their cloud infrastructure uh, numbers came out, they had about 300 three percentage points uh, contribution from AI in general, we think that number climbs throughout the year. Um, that's an area where we are most optimistic that it is going to lead to a good recovery for Microsoft's organic growth rate in the second half. And we have already seen from, uh, you know, results from IBM that things uh, things are actually looking rosy for the tech industry. NVIDIA has done well. TSMC talked about a good, uh, you know, year this in 2024. So we feel confident that, um, you know, Microsoft growth rates will improve as the year progressive, because when you look at overall technology spending, um, you know, companies have been under investing for the last two years. You know, they really did well at the five years before that, but you know, we have seen a pause in the last two years. So we think 2024 could be the year where we see a revival in tech spending. Well, let's talk just for a minute about uh, Microsoft's gaming division and reports last week that it's laying off nearly 2,000 workers at its recently acquired Activision Blizzard unit and Xbox unit. Yep. Is this just a redundancy of jobs or, or is it indicative of, of more trimming down at Microsoft? No, uh, it's just, I mean, normally when you make a very large acquisition, they, they bought Activision for $69 billion. Um, and Activision at the end of 2022 had 13,000 people. So when you look at the article, I, I saw that, um, you know, that, that said they had about combined about 22,000 people. So you would expect some redundancies from an acquisition. That's the cost synergies. Whenever you have duplication, you will see a little bit of that. I don't see that as an indication that the business conditions are bad. This is more so right-sizing and changing the margin structure of the company. There is a lot to look forward to. Well, our thanks to Anurag Rana, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst. Thank you for joining us. We now turn our attention to the U.S. economy. Two big events this week, a two-day Fed meeting and a decision on interest rates. Also, the January jobs report. And for a preview, let's bring in Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Michael, thank you. And well, let's start with that FOMC meeting. And after three meetings in a row of leaving the federal funds rate unchanged, what are you expecting to see on Wednesday? Uh, I'm expecting to see the Federal uh, Open Market Committee leave interest rates unchanged. <laughs> Four meetings in a row. Uh, they went into the blackout period saying uh, that they basically were looking at not moving interest rates because they're waiting for more data. And so uh, they're not going to surprise the markets. We've gotten a lot more data that are interesting, but they're not anything that would move the Fed to any kind of emergency change in plans. Uh, but the question that everybody's going to be asking is, what about the March meeting or what about the May meeting? Jay Powell not going to really answer those, but will he push back against the market expectations of uh, at least a cut in May? Well, let's talk about the data then that will lead to uh, what you expect to see unchanged uh, about the economy. We got some pretty good encouraging news last week about inflation, about jobs. 
Yeah, the economic data that came in during the last week, during the blackout period, when we can't ask them about it, was extraordinarily strong. Fourth quarter GDP at 3.3%, much higher than the anticipated uh, number, and uh, not down all that much from what we saw in the third quarter. Uh, Consumer spending was strong, business investment picked up, and those would make the argument uh, that the Fed wants to keep interest rates uh, unchanged for longer, except that the uh, the inflation numbers have continued to go down, which suggests that maybe they can cut. So uh, now <laughs> it gives them even more reason to say we want more data to confirm what we're seeing, because if they had to make a rate decision this time, uh, it would be a close call. And that more data that they're going to get, we're going to see on Friday. Yeah, and that's kind of interesting because uh, we're going to see a a slower job creation number, at least uh, according to uh, what the Bloomberg uh, consensus of the survey is, 168,000 now. We'll see next week when we get some additional data from ADP and the ISM numbers, whether that changes people's minds. But um, the uh, unemployment rate is expected to rise a little to 3.8 percent. Now, the Fed is predicting that. But the wild card here is, remember all those storms we had earlier in January? Did they keep anyone from going to work? That's going to be an interesting question because you basically only have to show up or uh, zoom in, I guess, uh, once during the week and you're counted as employed. So some people think that we may see this lower number because we had weather interruptions, but it's pretty hard for weather to make a huge difference in the overall number. So it's going to be interesting to see what we get and then what the Fed thinks of that. They want to see a slowdown. If we don't get it, then that adds weight to the idea of higher for longer. Higher for longer. Well, some jobs, certainly. I mean, January is always volatile, as you've said before. But some jobs like housing, where you have a big ice storm, I mean, that just you know, shuts down for two weeks. Yeah. Well, it, it's going to be, I hate to say, in, interesting again because it's – I've been saying that a lot, but it's going to be interesting again because we also got new home sales last week, and they were stronger than anticipated in the month of December. But people don't go out looking for houses when there's a lot of snow on the ground or or weather is bad or something like that. Or, or so they just had the holidays. So we may see a weather effect on that and also on construction, new uh, uh, building starts, because uh, it's hard for during a blizzard to start digging a hole and putting up uh, two-by-fours. So there may be some weather-affected data, but uh, it won't be – It won't be decisive for the Fed. Oh, a lot to look forward to. Well, our thanks to Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we head to Europe for a preview of the policy decision coming from the Bank of England. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, we get an update on the health of the Chinese economy. But first, after the ECB and the Bank of Japan, investors will be looking for their first clues about the path for interest rates from the Bank of England in the coming days. Markets are expecting the first move in the summer, but Governor Andrew Bailey is not convinced the fight against inflation is over just yet. For more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor, Caroline Hepker. Tom, the latest inflation figures for the UK showed an uptick in December, complicating the path ahead for the Bank of England. Whilst the BOE was the first major global central bank to start hiking interest rates, some analysts think that it'll be the last to start cutting. The question of when is still the main preoccupation for markets, though. We've been discussing this with many of our guests on Bloomberg Radio. Now, here's what Charlotte Ryland, the head of investment at CCLA Investment Management, told us about her expectations for the Bank of England decision. Clearly, they were a little late to the party in terms of sort of pushing the rates up. Um, the UK economy seems to be somewhat more inflationary than others. And I imagine part of that is you know, some of the dislocations we've had from the back of Brexit, the sort of tighter labour market that we have, which is to do with migration as well. So, you know, it's been a more, a more difficult, uh, you know, position for, for them. And it's clearly a much more vulnerable economy in terms of, you know, the consumer as well. So it's a, it's a delicate uh, tightrope that got to balance between the inflationary pressure and, and more completely derailing the economy. 
So that's Charlotte Ryland's view. Now let's hear from Sam Linton-Brown from BNP Paribas. He's talked to us about how the Bank of England is in a different position to other major global central banks. The Bank of England potentially could prove to be a little bit more of an idiosyncratic narrative this year because one could argue that the um, stickiness of inflation will prove to be more persistent than elsewhere. Our central case is that the Bank of England will begin cutting rates around the middle of this year, cut by 125 basis points. That's not too different to what markets are currently pricing, but I'd say if there's a risk on the three ECB, Fed, Bank of England, where they actually end up doing less tightening because of inflation, or less easing, I should say, because of inflation, I'd say it's, it's the Bank of England. So that was Sam Linton-Brown from BNP Paribas. And those are some of the views from the markets. Uh, In terms of the outlook for the Bank of England, on the data front, headline inflation was 4% in December for the UK. The PMI surveys for January brought better than expected readings, but the manufacturing sector still in contraction. So economists do widely expect the Bank of England to hold interest rates at their next meeting at five and a quarter percent. So it is going to be the post-meeting press conference, which is going to have the potential to produce more answers, uh, perhaps. I've been discussing that with our senior economics reporter Philip Aldrich. I started by asking him what he'll be watching out for in the decision from Governor Andrew Bailey and colleagues. Yeah, and I mean, not just from Bailey, uh, but the so the whole nine member rate setting committee uh, will uh, they make their judgment. And the last meeting, uh, which was um, about the second week of December, three of them voted for rate rises, the other six decided to hold rates. Now, since then, the inflation numbers have come down more quickly than expected. There's been a bit of a uh, question, a few questions about whether we're going to have a brief technical recession. Um, these kind of um, messages or economic signals would suggest that the Bank of England needs to start thinking about rate cuts. And obviously, that's what ha- is happening in Europe at, at the European Central Bank and at the Fed. So there is this, so the Although we're not expecting anyone to, well, maybe one member may vote for a rate cut. Um, we're not expecting the committee as a whole to vote for a rate cut. Mm. This is gonna, it's something which which people are going to be looking out for for uh, to see whether the bank is now sort of following the other major central banks in sort of signalling that there may be a change of direction. Yeah, absolutely. And the Bank of England decision comes fairly swiftly after the ECB interest rate decision, and yet. Is there a difference, a kind of gap opening up between the position of the UK and the Bank of England and, as you say, the Fed and the ECB? Well, the, the gap, so the, the gap is, it's not on the rate, where the rate policy is. I mean, obviously, Bank, Bank of England's up there with the Fed and higher than the ECB. The gap is in, in, in the future trajectory of policy. And the, uh, the Fed uh, has signalled that they are considering rate cuts. The ECB has, I mean, the, the uh, the president of the ECB, Christine Lagarde, said that the uh, June may, you know, there may be rate cuts starting in in the summer, um, uh, and uh, obviously the market is now pricing these rate cuts in for all three central banks. What we are not, what we've not heard from the Bank of England is any kind of hint that they're going to move in this direction. So the last communication they had was all about, um, you know, we need to worry about potential for further inflation we've mm. got to be vigilant these kind of you know further tightening maybe on the cards three people did vote for a rate rise so it's so their so their language is kind of out of step with the sort of consensus thinking at the moment um uh, that you know there have been you know wages are still being proving a little bit stronger than mm-hmm. we're expected you know we've had we've had in the very latest data we've had uh, the PMIs, the business activity numbers, that they have been relatively strong, and so the, so you know markets are beginning to think that it's, you know, there's not going to be just masses of rate cuts over this year. But the bank has got to start sig- signalling that this this is something that is on the agenda now. In terms of the UK and you know whether it's in a special position or in a different position to to others, the Red Sea. How do we think about the inflationary pressures coming from the Red Sea? Obviously, the UK in with the US in taking action against, you know, Houthi militants, you know, which is the thing that is threatening shipping. Um, does that particularly affect the UK more than other places? No, the the sort of uh, the, the immediate effect on us is is the direct effect on us is not uh, is not enormous. Um, 
uh, we don't we there was I can't remember the specific numbers but the, uh, there was a, some economic study which showed that we don't actually get that much of our imports directly that are directly goods imports that are directly coming through the uh, uh, the Red Sea and then and the Suez Canal but there is this sort of second second round here so the stuff we are importing is coming from countries which are going to be um, feeling the effect of this or to, to a much larger degree um, there I mean it clearly is a risk I mean what we learned through the COVID pandemic was that when supply chains get disrupted that can be an enormous cost to business and that bus- that cost does get passed on and we have seen indications of that and, and so in the stronger PMI data that came out this week there was also uh, evidence that costs have started to rise again and and the and the acceleration in costs was was notable now you, they, mm. you could you could draw the uh, draw the correlation or co- the causation from the sort of red sea disruption in the houthi so it's it, it is it's definitely on it's something which people are being they're alert to the to the risks and i, I, I you prob- we're already potentially going to have a little increase in uh, the the inflation numbers for january which are not out yet um uh, so if you have that and plus these worries about the s- supply chain disruption, that you could start to get people getting a bit nervous about the, the inflation beginning to pick up again. There's quite a big mismatch between market expectations for rate cuts from the Fed um, and the Fed signalling, bit sort of less for the ECB. What's the picture for the market expectations around the Bank of England versus what we think they you know, what they are planning and saying. Yeah, so it's about a percentage point cut um, So the, uh, for this year and those cuts to start in May or June, depending on, I think it's around June now. But um, the uh, that is that is probably stronger than the Bank of England would like. Now, we are, inflation is likely to hit around 2% April, May, um, June time because we're going to have a big drop in the energy uh, price cap and that 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 fall in in April which it's a staggered three monthly reset um, that fall in April is anticipated and it's expected to d- deliver this you know we finally back to inflation target you know there are concerns that um, it could then start accelerating later on mm. but the Bank of England is not going to want to just say oh we've hit two percent right job done we're going to get back down to you know three percent super quick there you know there are underlying pressures you've got services and, and core inflation which is still proving quite mm. uh, sticky. Uh, we also have to think that this Bank of England rate decision comes um, just a little bit ahead of the budget, uh, the beginning of March. Let's think about what the, the Chancellor is preparing to do. Um, a lot of emphasis, a huge amount of pressure on the government to cut taxes from within their own party, from the sort of thinking that Sunak and Hunt have. I mean, How are you thinking about that? Could that be inflationary? How does that play into the economic uh, picture for Britain? So for the, for the Bank of England, they're not allowed to sort of take government policy until it is government mm, policy so sure. people can assume what it will be but so we've got the march the sixth budget you know you would expect it's, it's sort of it's it's a tried and tested political playbook that you would um cut taxes give consumers and households a boost and make everybody have there's a bit of feel good factor going into the election and they've obviously lagging in the polls terribly so they they need something so um i mean i i'd assume if at the moment it looks like the change in the sort of the rate forecast has probably given um, uh, the the Chancellor something between five and ten billion. I think Bloomberg Economics is Dan Hansen's got those sort of numbers uh, ten, of headroom. And so, I, I mean, I would assume he's going to spend every penny of his headroom and more. Now, partly the motivation for this is not just to give people tax rises and make everyone feel better, but it's also to draw this dividing line, this battleground with Labour. And the and the more and the more money they spend, the more money that the, the conservatives spend within their fiscal rules, they uh, they can then they make it much more difficult for Labour to press ahead with their sort of 28 billion green investment plan without either having to ramp borrowing up much more or cut taxes or do something else. And so, it because of that commitment that the that Labour has made, it becomes more it becomes much more tricky for them. The the smaller the headroom is mm. that the government leaves them, uh, and so then their then their manifest commitments start to look a bit sketchy so I, I mean for two reasons for the feel good factor and for the political battle um, I'm expecting some big tax cuts and obviously you know beyond th- there will be some inflationary effect there but mm-hmm. I, it's not I don't think that anyone would suggest that it's going to be you know the same as the Ukraine the post Ukraine kind of the, the fear, sure. those kind of fears it might it might slow the rate of uh, rate cuts down but it wouldn't you know halt it there is the nagging voice I'll put it that way of the IFS the Institute for Fiscal Studies saying 
the government must be honest, whichever stripe it is, the, the next government has to be honest with the state of the public finances. I mean, really, a very kind of strongly worded criticism that the tax and spending plans look immensely difficult for Britain and that, you know, the plans have to be laid out clearly to the public. Yeah, uh, you know, they've made this... Uh, I mean, it's not the first time that they've asked sure. the government to be honest about the future trajectory for public finances. But the, um, uh, you know, absolutely beyond the election, the, the as I think it was OBR, OBR's um, chair Richard Hughes said that there is there is no detail on the planned spending cuts and the planned spending cuts for the departments other than health and maybe one or two other protected departments were effectively are a return to austerity. There's going to be real terms cuts, um, and that in a, in a in in an environment where everything is already sort of all the public services are already crumbling to a degree. Is it is it really conceivable? So that was our senior economics reporter, Philip Aldrich, speaking to me. And we will have, of course, full coverage of the Bank of England's rate decision on Thursday here on Bloomberg. I'm Caroline Hepke here in London. You can catch us every weekday morning for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London. That's 1am on Wall Street. Tom. Our thanks to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor, Caroline Hepker. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we take you to Asia for a very busy week on the economic front there. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. China struggling to shore up its economy and halt a $6 trillion stock market route despite the best government efforts. Now, with more eco data coming out in the coming days, Bloomberg Daybreak Asia co host Brian Curtis takes a look at the overall picture of the Chinese economy. Tom, we look forward to China's official PMIs in the coming week. It might be a little early to see a bounce in economic activity in China, but recent measures rolled out by the Chinese government have sparked a little more excitement about Chinese assets. The PBOC will, for instance, cut the bank's reserve requirements by 50 basis points on February 5th. Bloomberg Economics called that a forceful response to a slowing economy and that the central bank was likely to cut interest rates this quarter as well, all of which Bloomberg Economics said would give a positive jolt to confidence. Joining us for some insights about the challenges that China is facing in getting the economy and the markets rolling again is Jill Desis, China Economy and Government Editor at Bloomberg. Jill, earlier I spoke with Bloomberg economist Eric Chu, who covers China and Hong Kong. And just to give us a little bit more spice in our discussion, I wanted to uh, play some comments from him. I asked him if this might do the trick to turn the economy around. We think the policy move probably is already too late. You know, even in January, I think many of the markets, including us, were expecting uh, central PBOC to cut the MF rate last week, right? But they didn't deliver. I think that's a big disappointment for the market and uh, leading further leading to you know the stock market tumble uh, over the past week. So I think uh, that might be one of the reasons you know triggering the PBOC you know to hasten the moves and trying to also give more confidence to markets. Eric Ju again from Bloomberg Economics, and I'm sitting with Jill Desis, who's China Economy and Government Editor at Bloomberg. So what do you make of that comment that perhaps it's a little bit too little too late? Well, I think that at this point, um, the whole thing with uh, this economic slowdown really comes down to confidence, right? Confidence in the economy, confidence among investors that uh, the government can really turn things around. And I think that's a very fair point. I mean, look, we've seen over the past year several measures that the government has taken to try to uh, get activity going again, to try to restore confidence. We saw a very unusual uh, sovereign bond issuance from the middle of uh, October of last year, trying to, you know, get that uh, out to uh, fund more infrastructure projects, more construction, get things going again. We saw various measures to try to help uh, restore confidence in the property sector, whether that included, you know, lowering some mortgage rates, trying to encourage people to start buying homes again, incentivize them in that way. And we really haven't seen anything that's led to a more meaningful turnaround in, what, in what's happening in the economy. I think that's really just been underscored over the past few weeks with how much more of a sell-off we've seen 
in the in the stock market, right? I mean, that sort of, sort of really, really underscores that issue with sentiment here. So it's difficult to see what exactly the government can do to restore that level of confidence. But it does seem clear, at least, or the at least the message that investors are sending is that what has been done so far isn't enough. And um, I guess we're all just not really sure where to go from here. Given the property crisis has cut pretty deep, I mean, it's the main source of wealth for a lot of Chinese households. Is it the type of thing that we think could be turned around quickly? Uh, And is it just that investors should be more patient? Well, I think at this point, the Chinese economy is really kind of undergoing um, a a pretty structural change, right? And I think that that um, a lot of top policymakers have acknowledged that, that the sector, real estate, which uh, used to be, you know, used to comprise a quarter, if not a third of uh, all, all GDP in the world's second largest economy, just isn't really ever going to get back there. And so there's a lot of focus uh, among top officials about what exactly needs to become these new drivers of growth, whether that's uh, putting more into new energy, electric vehicles is a really promising area of renewables is a really promising area. But obviously, that kind of thing takes a lot of time. I think that if you're an investor, you want to see more progress on getting activity going again. You want to you know, see some indication that you're at least going to get households to start spending again. Um, but ultimately, yes, I think it's, it's difficult um, when you're seeing some of these more immediate issues with uh, deep fallout from the property crisis, uh, um, you know, not necessarily translating into an immediate fix and knowing that those longer term transitional phases are still obviously quite a bit of a ways off. And there is also a little bit of contrast uh, between some of these special measures that have been put in place or or called for by the government uh, and then, you know, tightness from the regulators. For instance, when the PBOC made the announcement about cutting the triple R, we also had another story on the Bloomberg Terminal about how Chinese officials are being told in the provinces that this belt tightening uh, posture by President Xi Jinping is here to stay and that leaders uh, are just going to have to get used to it. The norm is going to be frugality. Now, that's not necessarily something negative, but it contrasts a little bit with wanting to get the animal spirits going. You're right. I think that those do contrast with each other, but they're ultimately still two different strains. So from the regulatory perspective, yes, we've seen, obviously, over the past few years, an incredible crackdown uh, on various sectors, reigning in big tech, reigning in, you know, the education sector, all of these different areas. I think that that's, you know, sort of one one piece of this. Obviously, you know, property is another part of that, going back to, you know, the era of um, the three red lines. Um, and, and we've seen sort of this fall out in terms of how much confidence um, investors, uh, businesses, foreign investment in particular has really sort of um, eroded over the over the past few years. I think that you know the government has also tried to send multiple messages saying um, that you know they want to be a little bit more di- you know discerning about regulatory policy. They don't want to catch as many people by surprise, but they're obviously still kind of struggling with that, right? I mean, you just have to go back to December, so not too long ago, when uh, there was a surprise gaming regulation uh, that was announced and then uh, caused a pretty severe stock drop for Tencent and some other major tech giants really sort of sent some jitters through the markets there. So I think that on that that side of things, the government still hasn't quite figured out how to guide people through this idea that the regulatory crackdown is easing up, or at least um, that they're going to better telegraph how exactly some regulations are coming into place. I think that on the monetary policy side, at least, which this is what you saw recently from the PBOC is they're actually in a in a really difficult position as well. I mean, uh, Eric was just saying a couple of minutes ago that they disappointed uh, earlier in January, saying that they weren't uh, um, going to cut policy rates, even though that was, you know, yeah. very widely expected. Um, and now they're, um, you know, trying to, they sort of front ran this triple R cut, this reserve requirement ratio cut. We really haven't seen that ever before. From well, and this was more dramatic, uh, 50 basis points. Say, even when they were thinking about cutting uh, the interest rate, it was only like 10 basis points, right? And then we got nothing. Uh, so it's a little surprising. It's a little, uh, a little bit underwhelming, I think, to investors. However, in this past week, we saw a little bit of a pickup in appetite for Chinese assets. Is it sustainable? 
Well, I think we have to see where else the PBOC really goes with these measures, right? I actually thought what was really interesting from this PBOC press conference with the governor uh, was not just that you see this uh, reserve requirement ratio cut being front ran bigger than expected, but also it really seemed like they were focusing a lot more on structural policies to kind of guide credit into more of their favored sectors. So in addition to the triple R cut, uh, Pen Gong Sheng, the, uh, the PBOC governor, also announced announced, um, you know, some uh, that they were cutting some relending rates um, so that they could, um, you know, better benefit, make it make it easier to loan to. I think the agricultural sector was one. They were setting up a new credit market to promote credit for uh, green divisions, elderly care, that kind of thing. So you're actually seeing in some ways the uh, central bank uh, go all the way back. Um, you know, you'd have to go back several years, I think, to this idea that uh, they're more interested in using monetary policy tools to direct credit themselves to certain sectors. I don't think that's something that we've really seen from the central bank in quite a while. They broaden the use of commercial property loans for developers. Now, this would be new money, I guess, being able to go to the developers to help them pay off some of their debts. Uh, Is that consistent with the previous theme? Yes, well, I think it's consistent with w- the direction that it seems that the central bank has kind of been going at least over the past few months. So again, um, you know, we saw a much longer term uh, change or shift from the PBOC to build more of an interest rate corridor, um, you know, ad- address policy rates rather than just some of these other structural policies. I think that's begun to change over the past few months. Um, we didn't. One thing that we didn't see out of this recent press conference with the PBOC was, um, you know, turning to other types of tools. Um, uh, there's there's this one called pledged supplemental lending, which is essentially funneling money into policy banks so that they can um, you know help fund um, you know property related sectors in particular. Uh, we didn't see that too much, although they have been uh, making use of that tool recently. So I do mm-hmm. think that uh, you know even if you're seeing a shift, it's something that's been happening at least over the past couple of uh, months. Let's go back to Bloomberg economist Eric Jew for a moment. Mm-hmm. I asked him about the mix that we've seen between fiscal and monetary stimulus. The monetary easing itself, you know, even interest rate cut, triple R cuts, yeah, that's give you something, but not that huge. I think our view is uh, the fiscal side needs to do more compared to last year, because I think even PBOC steps up easing, is still to be, you know, incremental. Somebody is calling for PBOC to cut interest rate to zero, right? So, but I, I don't think PBOC are going to move that aggressively. So still on the monetary side, we don't expect a huge boost to the growth. More is from the fiscal side. And fundamentally, I think even with those more fiscal stimulus, that's probably still not enough. I think fundamentally, it's the policy direction. It's the policy, you know, orientation that's most important for the market right now. So we're talking about some monetary stimulus measures, some fiscal stimulus measures, and then communication measures, uh, building confidence. Uh, Of those three, what do you see as most important, Jill? I will say on the fiscal stimulus side, that's obviously, I think, going to become more important This year, there's a growing consensus among a lot of economists, including, obviously, Bloomberg Economics, uh, that there does need to be more fiscal stimulus. Um, Maybe we aren't going to see the type of massive stimulus that we saw in the aftermath of uh, the financial crisis, where you just see tons and tons of money being pumped into the economy. But we do know that, you know, officials are discussing various measures. Um, Bloomberg News reported uh, very recently that uh, there's some debate over um, the issuance of some additional uh, special sovereign debt to sort of fund some infrastructure projects. So there are funding avenues there. But ultimately, a lot of those reports haven't really moved the needle much, right? So I think that brings it back to this idea of um, that communication issue. I mean, whatever policymakers are saying right now, clearly markets aren't really taking that as, um, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, reason to be more confident in the long term. You might see some little jolts here and there in, in terms of markets. Maybe the Pang Gang Sheng uh, comments, uh, you know, just, just recently did boost, um, you know, equity markets for uh, um, you know, a couple of hours or a day or what have you. But yes, I think that it's more um, about uh, that idea of how do you how do you project uh, that level of confidence in, in that policy direction? How do you present a clear vision uh, to the public, to your investors about where this economy is going? Um, that's really what we need to see here. Jill, thank you so much for joining us. Jill Deese is China Economy and Government Editor at Bloomberg. I'm Brian Curtis. Along with Doug Krisner, you can catch us every weekday here for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, beginning at 9 a.m. in Hong Kong and 8 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Well, our thanks to Bloomberg's Daybreak Asia co-host Brian Curtis. 
And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.